Okay, we are going to finish our discussion on the Baltimore 6 case. And most of the stuff, a couple of things I'm going to say have been will be repeated from the last Baltimore 6 videos. Please bear with me. The district attorney's office, which was probably Mom Mosby herself. It could have been an assistant of hers, but it was probably Mom Mosby herself. Ordered the police department to do increased presence of that particular area and to also do increased pressure on known criminals drug dealers gang members people that are on probation or parole registered sex offenders the police has a list of people they know are troublemakers and she wanted increased pressure on them. Now, last time I checked, Freddie Gray fit that description perfectly. Over two dozen arrests. Each arrest had three felony charges on it, at least. So, Freddie Gray fit the bill. Now, there were two bicycle officers, and I'm probably not going to know every single minute detail down to the wire. And there's going to be a couple of things I'm going to say it is believed or it is alleged. So, just bear with me when I say this, okay? Two bicycle officers were around, and they're just minding their own business in the neighborhood, and Freddie Gray takes off running. Now, if you have police officers that are just hanging around, there's no shooting going on, there's no fire, if they're just hanging around or walking through the neighborhood, and you take off running, what does that tell them about your character? So they ran after him. And it is a belief, but not proven, that Freddie may have swallowed something. Now, you've seen the movies where the guy's running from the cop and he throws the gun and throws the crack and throws a child porn magazine. They throw all this shit away. They throw things in dumpsters. They knock things in, in, a, in, in the sewer drains. You've seen all that shit. Well, I'll tell you right now, if you swallow something, one way or another they're going to get it, put it that way. Yeah, ew. But he does run from there and they do give chase to him and they do grab him. Now, if a 250, 160 pound guys grab you and throw you down or tackle you or hit you the wrong way, it's entirely possible, most likely even, that you will actually be hit or bruised or hurt something or twisted or turned, okay? And they get on the ground. Now, Terry v. Ohio, Supreme Court case, says that a police officer, sorry, I just got out of the shower, my eyes are watering. A police officer can legally clap you for weapons. Now, my professor, the Virginia State Trooper, would clap a guy, squeeze his pocket, and be like, that's cocaine. But cocaine is not a weapon, and he could not search further. If they feel something hard, yes, no pun intended, they are allowed to put on their puncture-proof glove and stick their hand inside the pocket and examine it. Depending on legal versus illegal, criminal versus citizen, they may take it away from you, or they may even charge you with it. Now, there are a million different ways to open a knife. You've got nail nick this, assist open that, thumb stud this, automatic that, out the front that. There's a thousand different knives, okay? Talk to Jeff from, Gun from Cutley Lover about that. But the knife mechanism is, quote, illegal in Baltimore. Now, in New York City, they enforce illegal knife, they enforce unconstitutional knife laws all the time on law-abiding people. But, for the most part, we have what they call blue laws. It is illegal in certain states to walk backwards down the street with an ice cream cone in your hand. It is illegal in Connecticut to leave the house if your pants and jacket don't match. 190 years ago, a bunch of lawmakers got bored and they just drank a shitload of whiskey and they wrote down whatever came into their heads. Now obviously no one's gonna enforce these laws today. Also the most common one which I've talked about is the air freshener on the mirror. Most cops don't care you have an air freshener on the mirror, but what they'll do is they'll pull you over, give you a traffic ticket for having an air freshener on the mirror, and they'll be like, okay, now that I've got you stopped anyway, that or that, you're being arrested now. Okay, Freddie Gray, had an illegal knife on him. Now I've said it before, I'll say it again. 
if a black priest or a black construction worker or a black college student had that knife mechanism on him, either A, they wouldn't even notice it, or B, they wouldn't give a shit. They're just not going to, okay? They, they don't want to handcuff you, search you, bring you to jail, fill out a ton of paperwork, go to court. They don't want to do that shit. But in Freddie Gray's case, because he's a known criminal, they enforce the law. And what that is called, that's called the, the groundwork. They grab him, they say, okay, the knife's illegal, boom, you're getting charged. And now that you're getting charged, we're going to search every square inch of your body, which is what they do when you're arrested. No Fourth Amendment when you're arrested. They search every square inch of your body, they run your name, they run this and that, and they find that all the outstanding warrants you got, plus the drugs you got, plus the gun you got, okay, plus the kidnapping victim you got tied up at home, okay. I mean, they, they, they literally run through the checklist of all the shit you've done wrong. And the groundwork was laid by the knife. So a lot of police departments do that. They have this little stupid law that no one cares about, but when a known criminal breaks that little known law, they bust him for it. Okay, that means if you live in one of those states and you're walking backwards with an ice cream cone in your back pocket down the street, but the cop knows you're a drug dealer, he can arrest you for walking backwards with an ice cream cone in your pocket and say, okay, now you're a drug dealer, but whatever. Now they can't bicycle him back to the precinct or the station house or the jail so they call in the van. And when they call in the van, he allegedly falls limp. Now, most people that knew Freddie Gray said as many times he was arrested, he wanted to play sick, he wanted to play hurt, he wanted to sue, he wanted to be like a fucking giant five-year-old. But it's entirely possible that he may have already been hurt for the fall. So now you got a case with A, he's faking it, or B, the boy who cried wolf, where now that he's really hurt, no one believes him. So they put him in the van. Now, recent police policy in Baltimore, which was changed like a week earlier, said from now on, buckle the guy in the van, and the van's driver is the one responsible for that. Now, Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, you could also apply this to the police department, even though he mostly talked about the military, said, if the order is clear, it is the fault of the subordinate. If the order is not clear, it is the fault of the superior. Between the commissioners, the chiefs, the captains, the lieutenants, the, the, the watch commanders, the instructors, it was their job to make sure every officer in the city, in particular officers who drive the van, to know that from now on, when you have a suspect, you buckle him in. Now, it is believed that the officers on the ground were not told of this new rule. Now, if the officer is told of the new rule, it's his fault for not following it. But if he's not told the new rule, it's his superior's fault for not telling him. Okay, whether they put a notice on the men's locker room and the women's locker room, attention from now on, this, that, and that. Whether they put a notice by the punching clock, because some people punch in, or sign in, or most likely they call the roll. They you know, Smith, Jones, Montgomery, here, 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 not here, not here. Okay, the watch commander calling the roll can say, okay, you're all here, no excuses. Here's the new policy. Read it right now or I'm gonna read it to you. Okay, but it is believed he did not know the new rule, therefore it's his superior's fault, not his. Now, when he's when police vehicle is coming to the scene, they have the lights on, they run red lights, they spiel and bullshit. When they go home, even if they got a guy in the back seat, most of the time they just drive. Normally. And when a police vehicle is driving normally, or a fire vehicle, or a paramedic vehicle, or any emergency vehicle, when they do not have the light on, they are required to obey the same laws we do. Now they accuse the officer later on of doing a rough ride, which is you speed, Jimmy brake, swerve, to fuck the guy up in the back. Okay? The surveillance cameras show he made a rolling stop. In America, when you come to a stop sign, you're supposed to stop your vehicle completely, look both ways for oncoming cars, oncoming pedestrians, stop for them, obviously, and then when they're clear, go. 
He just slowed down to a crawl and coasted through, which is a traffic violation. Now, because he doesn't have the light on, he's required to follow the same laws as you and me. But that, at most, is a traffic violation. And if the traffic court judge saw the video of him making a rolling stop, the traffic court judge is going to give him a fine. And yes, police officer, not in response, can still get a ticket for not obeying the law. But traffic violation is here. Depraved heart homicide is here. Okay? There is no evidence that aside from the traffic violation of making a rolling stop, there is no evidence he deliberately did anything wrong. And he made several other stops and put a man in the van for an unrelated reason. The van was divided. Um, the van was divided vertically from, from left to right where you got a left side and a right side looking on a wall and there was a man on this side of the wall we'll talk about him later now they say that they knew he, Freddie Gray was hurt and sick and ignored him well it was later believed that Freddie Gray may have been hurt at the last stop or the second to last stop very late in the drive when they get to the precinct, the sergeant comes down, female sergeant, and she sees him fucked up, and she's like, just get him inside, call the paramedics, whatever. She never, she won't want the trial, though. So, he ends up dying. And then the charges come down. Everything from jaywalking to the prey for homicide. Now, the trials start. Now, the Supreme Court said, if you're charged with a misdemeanor, you can ask for a jury and the judge can give you one, but they don't have to. They can do a bench trial. But if you're charged with a felony and you want a jury, you have to have one. You would typically talk to your lawyer about what's best for you, bench trial versus jury trial, but the end, the end um, uh, decision will be yours. Now, a jury trial means the judge calls in the jury and the jury makes a decision. If all 12 jurors say not guilty, you can never be retried. And they have literally had defendants, the entire jury would get up and say not guilty. And as soon as the jury said not guilty, the defendant would jump up and say I did it. They can't charge him. If all 12 jurors say you did it, you are guilty, you go to prison. Now, the reason why I'm against the death penalty, side note, is because the average innocent person spends 15 years in prison before they're, exoner before they're exonerated at a later trial date. And I met a man who spent 16 years in prison. He was 17 years old and spent 16 years in prison for rape and murder he didn't commit. And the average death row inmate is executed in 10 years. So if you're innocent and on death row, You'll be dead five years before you're exonerated. So that's why I'm against the death penalty on a side note. But you're guilty, you go to prison, and you have to spend, it could be five minutes, it could be 20 years before you get a new trial. If the jury cannot make up their mind, it's called hung jury or mistrial, or they have a couple of words for it in different places where you are. Mostly they say hung jury, but some places say mistrial, believe it or not. If the jury cannot decide, there is a loophole to the Sixth Amendment and you can be retried. Now that's what happened in this case. You had The jury is people from the neighborhoods. Yes, them. 18 years old, must be a U.S. citizen, must read, write, and speak English, must not be police officer, must not be firefighter, must not be military member, must not be elected official, must not be elected official's cabinet member, must not be convicted felon. That means you literally could have guys the night before throwing rocks at cops, and unless they were caught and brought to trial, they themselves could have been on the jury the next day. There were guys saying, I want to register to vote, it's like, Lindsay's fucking cops, get, get sent to the jury, and Lindsay's fucking cops. The jury list can come from voter registration, which means not that you voted, but they are registered to vote. DMV vehicle registration, 
license registration, which means you have a car, a boat, a plane, a helicopter, um, tax returns, welfare receipts, food stamps, censuses. I mean, every 10 years you got to the government, I'm including your house. And they get these whole, if your name is on paper somewhere, you can get on a jury. It's not just registered to vote. My uncle, about 15 years ago, was called to jury duty, and he had to excuse himself because he's a convicted felon. He could not serve. But, God forbid you get 12 of these assholes that are out there and fuck the police, okay? They're going to lynch you. But then there are a couple of innocent people in Baltimore that regardless of their skin, regardless of their political beliefs, they believe, they knew Freddy was a piece of shit. They send their kids to school, they work, and they realize that the town is being destroyed. He probably got a mixture of both on the jury, but if he had 12 assholes, he would've been fucked. Now, the other guys elected, now, when they have a hung jury, a lot of times the prosecutor will say, you know what, we tried, let's move on to something else, okay? But if it's like a serial killer or a mass murderer, they're gonna be tried as fast as possible. Sometimes the prosecutor will go back to the drawing board and say, okay, we got a hung jury, let's go over every minute detail and see if maybe we can retry it. Ugh. Well, as soon as they said mistrial, hung jury, Marilyn Mose was like, we gotta retry this case. Right then, we gotta retry this case. She wasn't in the courtroom, her subordinates were in the courtroom, but when she heard hung jury, she said, we gotta retry it. We gotta retry it. So they want to retry the case. The other guys come up. One, two, and three. They opt for the judge trial, the bench trial. Now, a bench trial, there is no jury at all. The judge makes all decisions himself, period. And that's pretty much a good thing because the judge went to law school. The judge was elected by the people. Or if it's a federal judge, he was appointed by the president. The judge swore an oath before God himself to not have any prejudice whatsoever, period. And even though this judge was a black man who spent his career as a prosecutor convicting corrupt cops, as a judge, looking at this case in a 100% neutral fashion, he realized there was no wrongdoing on the part of the officers. In order for you to be convicted at trial, A, you must be proven guilty, no question. There cannot be any question in any sane person's mind that you did it. And also, all the evidence has to be obtained legally and honorably. If any evidence was obtained illegally, if any evidence was obtained dishonorably, it can be a mistrial, it can be a dismissal of charges, and they've had judges that had a guy they knew was guilty of murder in their courtroom, but because someone lied or cheated or mishandled evidence, the judge said, listen, I have no choice but to let this guy go. Even though I know he's guilty, even though I got a wife and kids in this town, I have to let him go because you mishandled evidence and you violated his right to a fair trial. We'll get to that in a little bit. So, first case, no evidence to convict, dismissed. Second case, same thing. Third case, same thing. Other two cases plus the mistrial, Marilyn Mosby drops the charges. Now, it's entirely possible, I'm speaking hypothetically now, it's entirely possible that Marilyn Mosby, and judges are not supposed to do this, but some of them might anyway, hypothetically speaking though. The judge might have called Marilyn Mosby, I don't know if he did, I'm just saying this. And he might have said, he might have pulled her house on a day off. He might have said, listen, you see that game last night? Um, uh, you see that new movie that came out? Uh, is it going to rain tomorrow? Oh, by the way, now that I've got you on the phone and I'm talking about personal things and I'm not having any professional conversation at all, period, I'm going to mention this. Drop the charges. Okay. Judges, a couple of judges have done that before. They call the prosecutor in their, at their house on their day off to talk about personal things. And at the end of a 20 minute personal conversation, they say, by the way, you're an idiot. Or by the way, drop the charges. Or by the way, dismiss the case. They do that. They're not supposed to, but they do. Some, some of them do. Mal and Moe might have had an issue where every single employee in their office, including prosecutors, 
the clerks, the interns, the paralegals, the janitors might have come into our and said, listen, if you don't drop the cases right now, we're all going to walk out of here. All of us. She might have had pressure from a lot of these states that know the governor doesn't care, but a governor might call the prosecutor's office, the, the attorney general for the state might call the prosecutor's office, other prosecutors around the country might call the prosecutor's office, and they might pressure the prosecutor, the bar might call, and they might pressure the prosecutor to drop the case, even though they're not supposed to, they might still do it. But she drops the cases. Now, I said the evidence has to be obtained honorably and legally. No questions asked. Okay. Remember I s Okay. Let's start with the press conference. When a prosecutor gives a press conference, the prosecutor is supposed to say, Hello, I am the prosecutor. This is the case. This is the evidence. I'll see you in court. A, B, C, and D. I'm going to put a link to the press conference below if you haven't seen it yet. Marilyn Mosley, this is our time. I will deliver justice for this young man. Uh, she's not talking like a prosecutor. She's talking like an advocate. And that is prejudicial. Okay, the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury, when there is a jury, must be 100% neutral, no questions asked, period. Now, let's also talk about a little thing called disclosure. Remember my cousin Vinny? Yeah, we're going to go there. Where Joe Pesci is out with the prosecutor. They're out hunting. And he says, I like to get a look at your files. And the prosecutor says, okay, sure. And he calls the secretary and tries to print out everything. And he comes back and I'll tell him the Mr. Tomei's girlfriend. I got the files, all of them. He's such a good negotiator. Do you know why he gave you the files? It's called disclosure, you dickhead. Okay? Disclosure means that out of fairness to the defendant who is innocent until proven guilty, the prosecutor must give the defendant, the defense attorney, all evidence against them, including witness lists, um, DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence, surveillance videos. The prosecutor has to tell the defense attorney everything before it's presented in court. That way the, the defense attorney can practice their questions, can examine this and other thing, and if a surprise witness comes in, the defense attorney will say, wait a minute, Your Honor, I object. I can't have a surprise witness because I have not prepared my questions for him. There's also a thing called exculpatory evidence. Yeah. That means there's evidence that the defendant might be innocent. If the prosecutor gets evidence that suggests the defendant might be innocent, they have to report it to the defense attorney immediately. And that could be a witness, that could be evidence, it could be anything. Now, if the prosecutor has exonerating evidence, the guy is on trial for murder, the prosecutor gets the report, there's a guy locked up in prison, and that guy locked up in prison committed this murder and the DNA proved it and the guy on trial now was innocent. The defense, the prosecutor has to go before the judge within two minutes and say, listen, your honor, I just got a report saying this guy's innocent. The real guy is in prison already. There's a DNA evidence. I got to drop the charges right now. Now, the guy that was in the van with Freddie Gray on the other side, he probably told the cops, and you saw the guy because his, the press dropped his name. He's like, nah, nah, I ain't say that shit, blah, 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 I ain't no rat, yo. That was him. He probably told the cops, but definitely told his attorney that Freddie Gray was probably banging around and jumping and trying to hurt himself on purpose so he could sue later on. And you've seen these assholes that go to the hotel and they fall down the stairs and they sue and the surveillance camera shows them falling on purpose. You've seen that shit. Okay, I have to. Now... Your defense attorney has what they call client attorney privilege, which means you could literally tell your defense attorney you murdered somebody and he can't tell anybody. But if your defense attorney hears about something that you did not do but witnessed, 
The opposite is true. He has to tell somebody. So the defense attorney says, he calls the prosecutor, he tells the prosecutor, listen, my client was arrested with Freddie Gray. He was in the opposite side of the van. My client says Freddie Gray was banging his head on purpose to hurt himself. And the prosecutor is required to tell this to the defense attorneys, and the defense attorneys are allowed to talk to the witness and call him to the stand. Now he has to testify because the Fifth Amendment says you cannot be forced to testify against yourself, but you can be forced to testify against someone else. So he would have been forced to testify under oath in court that, yeah, I was being arrested, I'm innocent of the proven guilty, and while I'm being arrested, the guy next, in the next, on the next side was banging his head, okay? Prosecutor did not tell the defense attorneys that. That is another example of misconduct because the prosecutor, Marilyn Mosby, did not tell the defense attorney, which means right there and there the case could have been dismissed. Now, when you have you seen court TV, you never see the jury, but you see the judge talking to the jury. Okay, when a jury comes on a case, the prosecutor tells the jury, you are now the jury, and from this moment on, you will not look at any evidence of pertaining to this case unless that evidence is presented here in court in front of me. No newspapers, no television shows, no documentaries, no Fox News, no CNN, no nothing. If two guys are having a conversation about the case when you're out on the weekend, that's fine, you walk away. The, the, the prosecutor, the judge, and the jurors are all in the same boat here. They are required by law to only look at evidence presented in court, period. And they are forbidden to allow any prejudice to enter their minds, period. Period. Marilyn Mosby went to a Prince concert. Yeah, Prince. <laughs> and at this Prince concert, he is race pimping the Freddie Gray case, the Mike Brown case. Prince is being a typical Hollywood asshole. The cops suck, fuck the police, Black Lives Matter. The guy with the gun that was shooting at the cops was a saint, okay? Prince is being a typical piece of shit. The law of prosecutorial conduct require Marilyn Mosby to get up and leave the concert immediately because she is not allowed to hear anything pertaining to the case unless it's in the courtroom. She cannot allow herself to be prejudiced by Prince's rants and by him singing about Freddie Gray and singing about Mike Brown. She does not leave the concert hall. She gets up on stage. It does not matter if she walked up on stage. It does not matter if Prince invited her on stage. It does not matter if she was carried on stage. It does not matter if the concert goers got on their hands and knees at the stage so she could step on them to get to the stage. The only thing that matters is that she did not leave the concert immediately. That is an example of prosecutorial misconduct and the case should have been thrown out right then and there. Okay? So the judge, who was the only one doing their fucking job in this case apparently, said, listen, I cannot find any evidence that they killed Freddie Gray I cannot find any evidence. Maybe they did, but I can't. you can't prove it to me. So because you can't prove it to me, they are not guilty. And the judge did the right thing. A black man in a, in a predominantly black city realized that it was his job to obey the law and not race pimp and panhandle to the voters. Now... Prosecutors, judges, and jurors have immunity. They can't be sued or prosecuted to a degree. If a prosecutor, judge, or juror obeys the law, period, they cannot get in trouble even if they made an honest mistake. And they've had innocent guys come out of prison because someone made a mistake. 
and they investigated and the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury did not know about that innocent mistake and they can't be in trouble. But maybe they can't be getting in trouble for it. But if you have any misconduct between them, they can be sued, they can be disbarred, and they can be imprisoned. The guy that prosecuted the Duke rape case, the Duke rape case, and my cousin's friend was involved in that, by the way. My aunt said his life was destroyed. He had four rich white men who were accused of raping a black stripper in a predominantly black city. The prosecutor knew the woman was lying and he was going to allow her to commit perjury anyway and he was going to put four innocent men in prison for 20 years because he wanted to be able to convince the black voters to vote for him. Okay. He was disbarred. He spent 24 hours in jail, even though he should have spent longer in jail. I saw a Netflix documentary on it. Go check it out if you can. And they reopened his old cases, and it turns out he prosecuted an innocent guy for murder years ago, and that innocent guy was released. Marilyn Mosby is going to be disbarred. The officers are suing her for, for prosecutorial misconduct, which they can do. Because she was at the Prince concert, she was panhandling to the voters at the podium during the press conference, she withheld a, a witness from them, so she can be sued. And they may even bring criminal charges against her, we gotta wait and see about that. Now, wrongful death lawsuits, I'm almost done here. Wrongful death lawsuits, when someone dies, the family members say, listen, they died because of you. Who was you? You was the police department. You was the hospital. You was the emergency room. You was the, you is the, um, the amusement park. Okay. Uh, having prevented several long, wrongful death lawsuits myself, a wrongful death lawsuit starts at $10 million, roughly. And the more things the defendant did wrong, hospital, police department, amusement park, the higher the, the price goes. The more things the deceased did wrong, the lower the price goes. Example, in Disney World, every once in a distant blue moon, you get a guy have a heart attack on a ride and die. Disney hires their private investigators, and the private investigators will say, will find out that the guy that died had three heart attacks and two open heart surgeries. And as he walked onto the ride, he walked right past the great big sign that says people with heart conditions should not ride. And Disney will say, listen, we warned the, the guests not to go on the ride because they have heart conditions. He went on anyway. We'll give you $5 million cash. Okay, fine. That's how wrongful death lawsuits work. This wrongful death lawsuit, the family was given $6.5 million. No questions asked before trial. Now, Freddie Gray was a thief and drug dealer. Okay, between being arrested, between being in jail and prison, probation, parole, court. Okay, he cost the taxpayers money, a lot of money, because he was stealing from black people, because he was selling drugs to black kids because people were robbing black kids to get money to buy his drugs the world is better off without him now obviously this is me speaking personally if I were a prosecutor, a judge, or a juror I would never talk like this, and especially in court, God forbid but me talking to you personally now as a person, I'm not a public servant now, I'm talking as a private citizen okay the world is better off now that Freddie Gray is dead and black people in particular are safer now that Freddie Gray is dead. Because Freddie Gray, was, Freddie Gray was what is wrong with this country. Freddie Gray was what is wrong in the black community. Black people work hard, live honestly, send their kids to school, want their kids to succeed. And Freddie Gray was interrupting the honest black people and their 
attempts to make an honest living and raise kids properly. He was obstructing that by poisoning their neighborhood with drugs. Okay? Freddie Gray did not care that the black kids were ODing on his drugs. Freddie Gray did not care that black kids were robbed by junkies looking for money for his drugs. Okay? Freddie Gray did not care if someone got shot in a turf war over his drug deals. Okay? And if you look at how wrong is the defendant versus how wrong is the plaintiff. Civil case, it's defendant and plaintiff. Criminal case, it's defendant and prosecutor. But when you look at how wrong Freddie Gray is, with okay, it is Freddie Gray's family that should have been paying money to the city. Okay? Because Freddie Gray's family, see, US parents have an obligation to raise a responsible kid. Okay? And I did not hear Freddie Gray's family, I heard their family's attorney, Crazy Marilyn Mosby, is a hero, but Freddie Gray's family did not apologize to the black people in Baltimore because Freddie Gray sold drugs to their kids. Freddie Gray's family did not apologize to the taxpayers in Baltimore because Freddie Gray had to waste their tax dollars on court and trial and, and jail and... Okay? So, let's stop pretending like my friends, Humans for Target, said Okay, this guy was not a hero, and let's stop pretending he was a hero. Yes, he died, but the world is a better place than that he's dead. Okay? And we still don't know why he died. They still have not proven adequately why he is dead. Okay? So you have a bunch of guys on trial for a homicide but you can't prove why the victim died the alleged the victim okay society was the victim and Freddie Gray was the defendant okay that's how I see it okay I I'm happy Freddie Gray is dead I'm also happy Mike Brown is dead too sorry I am thank you goodbye